Hey folks, George here. Today, when we discuss philosophy of law, we're going to discuss an article by Mark Tushnet, where he really examines and ex uh, explains the theory of critical legal studies. Now, the first thing he starts with is that critical legal studies is a descendant of legal realism. Uh, if we recall from a previous discussion, the legal realism gives the ideas that judges uh, rationalize their conclusions. They arrive at conclusions first and rationalize those conclusions uh, using the rules that they have. And they arrive at their conclusions not by going rules first, reasons, and then conclusion, but rather they arrive at a conclusion first based on biases, uh, prejudices, and things like that, previous beliefs. So, and even feelings, right? Um, and now critical legal studies is going to take that uh, a step or two further, in fact, and we'll see how that goes. So, with that in mind, Mark Tushnet is going to say that if we really want to understand how the law works and how the structures and institutions work, what we really should be looking at are interest groups in society and all the different interest groups that exist in society. S identifying such social interests will really reveal how the legal system really works. How does it really work and how it really operates is based on all kinds of competing interest groups, not necessarily some laws that are written down, or even for that matter, judges uh, who are deciding certain cases. What happens is that decision makers have to balance all sorts of interest groups in various ways in order to make a society, what, uh, peaceful at least, or at the very least, to avoid revolt and avoid getting killed myself. How is critical legal studies going to differentiate itself from legal realism then? Well, critical legal studies uh, attacks the notion of policy analysis and balancing and shared social values. Such an assumption and such a set of assumptions is overly simplistic and doesn't, uh, just, just doesn't connect with the way the world really works. Furthermore, and this is going to be a deeper idea that's a lot more complicated to understand, but I think uh, once we do get through it, it'll uh, make a bit of sense to us. Furthermore, critical legal studies will uh, reject the idea that the law merely reveals personal interests. Rather, it's the legal system that influences our preferences. It's not that I have certain interests as a legislator or in a democracy when I vote for a legislator, and thus I want these rules in place. Rather, it's these rules that influence me and create these sets of preferences within me. That seems uh, rather uh, counterintuitive at first, but think about it this way. I personally, I grew up in Los Angeles, I grew up in the United States, and as such, I really value the First Amendment, freedom of speech, right? Why do I have that value though? Is that my preference? Or is it that I grew up in this society, and I grew up in a society that taught me to value freedom of speech so highly. Didn't uh, the laws and the education system and all of that and the culture around me really teach me what I should value? And that's how critical legal studies is going to flip certain ideas on their head. And that kind of does make sense to me because I've got friends all over the world who don't have such a high value for freedom of speech as I do, having grown up in America. I've got friends in Western Europe who laugh at me when I say freedom of speech, freedom of speech. And they say, wait, is freedom of speech really the most important thing? Right? Uh, certainly, there are other cultures around the world who value uh, freedom of speech very low in their uh, groupings of uh, uh, cultural values. And I've got friends there that say, so what? Yeah, you're right. I can't say whatever I want about the government, but who cares? I want to live a good life anyways, right? Now, 
they have those beliefs. The critical legal studies folks will say they've got those beliefs because of the culture they grew up in and the rules that framed their preferences. Well, I grew up over here, and so I've got these sets of rules that have framed my preferences. And that's what critical legal studies wants us to uh, recognize, the role that that plays, that the rules actually play in my own preferences, the, rule, the role that institutions play in shaping my preferences. And that's going to be a big, big deal here. And so when we really talk about meeting society's values and that the legal system should meet society's values, we must first acknowledge that it's the values that are constructed by the system that we're all living within. So therefore, critical legal studies really questions the very fundamental values of society. Because depending on the society we live in, we have different values, don't we? I think many of us can understand that. Those of us who've studied other cultures around the world at even just a little bit can understand that principle that critical legal studies is reminding us. There's nothing timeless or inherently valuable about any of our beliefs. I told you I really value freedom of speech. But there's nothing really timeless or inherent about the value of freedom of speech, especially since, according to the critical legal scholars, the only reason I really value freedom of speech is because I happen to be born in America and raised in America. So what is the point here then? What is the goal of critical legal studies? Um, just to throw everything for a loop? Well, not quite. Uh, kind of, but not quite. What they're really trying to remind us about is that we have to critique the contemporary structures, the status quo, so to speak. We always have to question the status quo and uh, the institutions in the society that we live in and try to at least become aware of those values that are instilled in us rather than my preferences just being generated within me. That said then, there isn't really a concrete uh, uh, goal for critical legal studies in terms of legal policy, right? In terms of legal policy, there aren't really concrete goals or proposals that are put forward. Rather, what they're trying to do is critique the program that we all live within. And their response when I say, so give us an answer. What do you think is better? For example, a very popular one that, they, uh, that critical legal studies folks will critique is just the nature of capitalism. The only reason that people like capitalism is because of this society. So people will talk to critical legal studies folks and say, so give us an alternative. And they'll say, that's not the point. That's not the point. What we should be doing, not necessarily, we've got enough people trying to give you answers. What we want to do is get you to question your fundamental beliefs question your fundamental ideas of why you value freedom of speech, why you value capitalism, and all these other things that you've been taught, reminding us again that it's all just a function of uh, society. It's all constructed by the society that we live in. Another goal of critical legal studies is to recognize the relationships between legal rules and power. Power, that sounds fun. Uh, reminiscent of the positivists, right? But they're going to do something, the critical legal studies folks are doing something a little bit different because they want us to really uh, uh, analyze the power structures. And of course, because whenever somebody's powerful, that also means that somebody else is weaker. Why is it this way, right? And why should it be this way? And don't the com uh, current laws, doesn't the status quo maintain this power structure, keeping the weak people weak and keeping the powerful powerful. Critical legal studies will try to remind us that that shall be or should be. We should question the very structure of the powerful and the weak. How does this work then? How can uh, critical legal studies folks try to and, and teach us about this 
odd power structure and rec get us to recognize that this power structure is in place? Well, their theory is to have as many stories and hear and listen to as many different perspectives. Listen to as many different stories. Listen to as many different voices as we can. Because there is no certainty or truth regarding the matter of why this is justified and this these weak group is justified to be weaker. There is no truth in that matter. Rather, there's competing stories. And the stories that we always hear are the stories of the powerful. Why don't we hear more stories of the weak, let's say, or the subordinate class, or the marginalized class? No story, according to the critical legal studies folks, shall have any epistemological priority, or none is more key to knowledge or truth, because really there is no such thing as truth, according to these folks, right? It's not true that capitalism is just the best form of uh, economic division of resources, a uh, distribution of resources, right? Why don't we hear other stories about the people who are really struggling so that we could challenge the powerful narrative that is so prevalent in our society? And that's what critical legal studies folks want us to do is hear more uh, diverse stories. How does this manifest in the 21st century? Well, we'll recall that very recently uh, Joe Biden was inaugurated as the 46th president of the United States. And there was so much in the news about Joe Biden being the first president to talk about the role of white supremacy in the U.S. and in the American power structure. He actually used the word white supremacy at his inaugural address. That is one example of how to tell more stories. Of course, prior to Joe Biden, Donald Trump would never talk about white supremacy, right? And apparently throughout uh, American history, we didn't hear the power structures really sharing ideas about white supremacy. We might also consider uh, different vocal groups, like let's say the Black Lives Matter protest and the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement as telling a different narrative, telling a different story about our legal system. Of course, a few years ago, the Me Too movement was telling different stories about the American legal system. Uh, Me Too movement telling stories about how women are mistreated under the American legal system. The Black Lives Matter movement telling stories about how uh, black lives are mistreated under the American legal system. And that is all, uh, uh, those are all movements that the critical legal studies folks would support greatly because we need to hear more stories, more diverse stories, rather than the stories that merely support the current power structure that is in place. Now, it goes without uh, doubt that this critical legal studies is influenced by the philosophies of deconstructionism and uh, structuralism. And that is to say that there are many competing narratives that are equally good at explaining the structure and our current situation, the status quo, so to speak. This is, critical legal studies, is a decentering project. What does that mean? They want to decenter the traditional narratives that say freedom of speech is of the utmost importance and that capitalism is of the utmost importance. They want to decenter the primacy of those powerful narratives that are so prevalent in our society. A significant question that is posed to such deconstructionists and critical legal studies folks is, well then, what are we trying to understand here? If all we're doing is hearing different stories, what is the goal? Well, I've already said that they don't have a goal, so to speak, in the traditional sense. And in the same way, critical legal studies is, uh, folks are going to say that we're not trying to understand the legal system in the traditional sense. What we are trying to understand is different narratives in a literary sense. Let's hear different stories, different literary techniques. Why 
is there this uh, attention towards literary techniques? Well, the example that Tushnet gives later on in his article is Kafka and how uh, Kafka-esque modern condition is. Our modern condition is Kafka-esque. Nobody understands anything. If we recall our uh, Franz Kafka in his novel The Trial, the protagonist is charged with a crime that he doesn't understand. And the process is a process that he doesn't understand. And at the end, he's executed for what? For something he doesn't understand. And that's what makes our modern system Kafka-esque. Who really understands what's going on here? What we should be doing is all giving our ideas, our all sharing our narratives, all sharing our own perspectives on these issues in order to critique the existing order. And in that way, in that way, the legal system will, well, be understood in a different way. I, I hesitated for a second. Did you see that I hesitated there? Because I wanted to say that the legal system will get better. But I don't think that's the goal of critical legal studies, to make the legal system better. Rather, we should be questioning the legal system no matter what the state it is, what state it's in. It should always be questioned. It should always be challenged, right? Because no matter what, there's always going to be a loser at the bottom of this power hierarchy. We should always challenge and critique this system. And with that in mind, there really are no morals at play. There is no ethics here. Rather, the goal is to decenter what we think we understand about the system. Simply critique the existing order. By the way, once you do establish a new order, because, you know, if they're critiquing capitalism, right? The alternative might be socialism, let's say, or communism. But guess what? Critical legal studies, if they're in a socialist or a communistic society, they would critique that system just the same. It just happens that here we are in America in a capitalist system. And so that's the system that's going to be critiqued, right? And that is why there's, uh, uh, that's further explanation rather as to why critical legal stu studies folks aren't really pushing an ethical or moral goal here or even a, an ultimate goal in the end. What does all that mean then? This can be rather controversial because after all, I said I value rights, I said I value free speech. Critical legal studies folks are going to critique that. Say, what do you mean about human rights? We talked about this during our discussions of the Nuremberg trials, right? And international crimes tribunals. Aren't human rights a Western construction? Critical legal studies folks will challenge even many things that we do hold dear, like human rights, like equal rights, right? Because we should understand, according to the critical legal studies folks, why it is we believe these things and what challenges something like human rights actually pose, right? Don't human rights pose terrible challenges? It's easy to say human rights from a capitalistic standpoint. Say, well, it's human rights. I have my private ownership of my own wealth. That's a human right, isn't it? Isn't private property a human right, according to at least many people in America? So we should critique, according to the critical legal studies folks, critique even the most fundamental ideas of human rights. The real uh, fundamental idea of underlying critical legal studies is that there's no real inherent value in anything, in any of our beliefs. Rather, they're all socially constructed, and as such, they are just as arbitrary as anything else. The only reason I believe what I believe is because I was, uh, uh, just by uh, fate, I was fated to grow up and be raised here. And there really is no inherent value in any of this. Well, that's a pretty radical idea now, isn't it? But one that I do think 
can contribute to many important movements and many important challenges that we do have in our society, especially around Black Lives Matter or a Me Too movement, right? Don't we want to talk about the marginalized folks or the lower, weaker folks in some, in any, in any social structure? And that's, I think, the value that these critical legal studies folks do bring to the table. See you next time. Bye-bye.